Okay, so um, the question, the next question we'll take a look at is the one on page 13. This is a really good question, it's a much longer question here, a um, little bit more to it than, than the previous examples, but you're going to see the very same maths again. So you can see on page 13 it says, um, a sample of the radioactive element cobalt-60 breaks down over time. The decay of cobalt-60 over time can be modelled by the function at equals a0 times e to the power of minus 2t over 15. So there's our formula there, same as the previous formulas, just um, it's slightly messier because the, fraction, the, the power is negative and it's a fraction, but it doesn't change the maths in any way. And we're told that at is the amount of cobalt-60 in the sample at the, after t years, a0 is the initial amount, so that's the amount of cobalt at the beginning. Remember, the initial amount means at the start, and T is the time in years. Okay? So it's worth reading that a couple of times just to make sure you've got your head around it. Remember, you've got plenty of time to do this. You've got 20 minutes, 40 mark question, 20 minutes to do it. Plenty of time to read that a couple of times before you get stuck in. So part one, it says a sample contains 112 micrograms of cobalt 60. Complete the following table to show the decrease in the amount of cobalt 60 over the six year period. So that's kind of the same way the previous questions are. But remember, in the previous question, we were just throwing that, that 0.05 into the form to get an answer. Here we're doing the same thing, but I'm throwing in a couple of different values for t. I'm going to be putting t equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. What's worth thinking about, because it might not be very obvious, okay, if you're kind of saying it's not obvious to me, it might not be, that in this particular question, a0 is 1, 1, 2. Now we're told in the question a sample contains 112 micrograms of cobalt 60. So that's the amount of cobalt in the sample at the beginning, the initial amount, that's A0. Alright, so for this particular question that's going to be A0. Certainly for the calculation we're doing now, that's M112. So the formula I'm going to be using when I'm doing my calculation the first part of the question is that 112, 112 times E to the power of minus 2T over 15. So I'll put T equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. If you're a Casio user, I recommend doing that using the table function. So if you press, um, if you go into your menu, the, the menu, okay, press shift in the menu button, option number two in there is for a table. Um, so with that, will allow you to type that form into your calculator and put all seven values at the same time. Not only does that speed you up, but it means you've got all seven numbers on screen at the same time. So when you're transferring them in here and drawing the graph, it looks like a point in the wrong position. You can check you've taken it down correctly, you won't have to recalculate it. All seven numbers remain on your calculator display screen at the same time. So I put the values in, I got that it's 112 for, for 0, um, 98 there for, for 1, then it's 85.8, 75.1, 65.1, 75.2, 75.3, 75.4, 75.5, and 50.3. So very simple there, um, 5 marks. Any one number put into that table correctly would pick up the low partial of 2. Two or more will get you three, and if the entire table is correct, you'll get five marks there. Five very simple marks, just throwing numbers into a formula. Okay, very common way to start a question. And then um, for ten marks, plot. So you can see that's not hard to do. So zero, it's one, one, two. That's up around there. I'm not going to do this very... Uh, so one is 98, that's around about there. I'm just doing this very roughly. Two is about, somewhere about there. All right, three, 75.1, somewhere around about there. 65.7. Okay, uh, 57.5, say there, and then 50.3, say there. So. All right, so just very roughly, it's a, okay, it's a, it's a nice smooth downward curve like that. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not quite a straight line, it's a very gentle curve. You've got going down an exponential m to k. Now, what's worth pointing out to you here, because you can kind of get ahead of this question if you're familiar with what these graphs look like. The Leaving Cert curriculum does say that you guys should be familiar with the shape of a graph of this form here. Okay, a times b to the power of x. So what does that graph look like? So what do these exponential graphs look like when you draw them? That's kind of what this question is getting at. So if you remember, when you're dealing with an exponential graph in a practical context like this, the overwhelming likelihood you're going to get one of these two shapes. Right? You're either going to get one of these, where the graph goes up like that, that's an exponential growth. Or you're going to get one of these where it curves down like that, which is an exponential decay. So these kind of curves model a lot of real world um, phenomena. For example, population growths. 
very often follow this kind of pattern here. In fact, there's a very good leading search question in 2017 dealing with the populations of two cities, which follow a pattern like that. So populations, bacterial increases, pandemic um, numbers spreading, okay, they follow an exponential pattern like that. Exponential decays, for example, temperature, Newton's law of cooling, um, uh, the temperature will drop exponentially like this. Um, radioactive decay, very common example of this as well. So you're probably going to get one of these two graphs here. The key thing to point out with these graphs, um, when you're dealing with, with, with a leading search question, is that number out in front there, the A out in front there, that's always where your graph begins on the y-axis. Because if you remember what we even have in the context of this question here, that A0 there, that's the initial amount. And that's always true. So in any real world question involving a formula like this, the number out in front is always your starting amount, your starting temperature, your starting population, your starting concentration. And that's obviously where your graph would begin on the y-axis, and it'll go up or go down from there. So that number there is always the initial amount, okay, which means it's, going, it's always going to be where the graph starts on the y-axis, no exceptions. Whether it goes up or down from there depends on this bit, okay, the b to the power of x. So if this number here, b, is bigger than 1, and the power is positive, you get one of these. So if, if b, if the number you're raising to a power is bigger than 1, and the power is positive, we get an exponential growth. goes up. If either one of those two things is not true, we get a decay. So if that number is less than 1, so for example it was a half to the power of x, remember what does power mean? It means repeated multiplication. So a half to the power of x means keep multiplying by a half. What would happen if you keep multiplying by a half? The numbers get smaller, so the graph will go downwards. So if this number here is smaller than 1, the graph, tends to, the graph will go downwards. Or if the power is negative, because a negative power is the same as a fraction. We'll talk about that in a second, one of your rules of indices. I won't get into it now, but you might remember that if you've got that a to the power of minus mp is 1 over a to the power of p. That's one of your rules of indices on page 21. So you remember that a negative power is the same as a fraction. So if that number is less than 1, or if the power is negative, they mean the same thing, and that's what will result in the graph going downwards. Okay? So if either of those two things is not true, you get exponential decay instead. Now that's worth having at the back of your mind, because I can kind of predict what I reckon a graph of this will look like even before I draw it. So just looking at that formula there, if before I drew it at all, I'd be saying, right, because the number out in front here is 112, I reckon the graph will start at 112 on the y-axis. Okay? And you can see it does. Okay? It begins at 112. That number there is bigger than 1, because E remembers 2.718 thereabout. That number is bigger than 1. But the power is not positive. So because that's not true, I reckon the graph will go downwards from there. And you can see it does. So I have a pretty good idea why the graph looks the way it does. All right? So we've got an exponential decay on our hands here, simply in this case because the power is negative. Okay? So I've got an idea of what's going on with this graph here. Um, and it's borne out by the graph I actually drew accurately. So that's 15 marks to begin with. You're kind of saying, well, that's very generous. There's a really good leaving cert quest. It's actually on page 32 of your handout. Okay, it's from the 2014 Leaving Cert Paper 1, question 9. It's a really good question about water cooling. It's about this guy, Kieran, who's, who's preparing a bottle for his baby. So he boils up some water and has to allow it to cool so he doesn't scald the child. So he has to allow the water to cool before he makes the bottle. And the cooling of the water follows a pattern like this. And for 15 marks in that question, you're asked to draw a graph. A quarter of the marks of the question involves drawing a graph like this very, very simply. So it is generous, but that take the marks from there when they come your way. Okay, so it's not an unusual thing to be asked to do. So that's the first two parts of the question there. You do at the table and draw the graph. So you can see we start with 112 micrograms of, co of cobalt-60, and the amount decreases over time. So we've got a decrease happening there over the first um, six years. So, next part of the question on page 14. It says the half-life of cobalt-60 is the time it takes for the amount of cobalt-60 in any sample to drop by 50%. Use your graph to estimate the half-life of cobalt-60. So the half-life is the length of time it takes for the amount of cobalt in the sample to drop by 50%. I'm asked to use my graph to estimate this. So, again, that might be worth chewing your pencil for a minute or two. It might not leap off the page how you do it. But once you spot how to do it, it's actually very simple to do. Okay? Because if you think about that, if our sample begins with 112 micrograms, that's the amount there at the beginning, at the half-life moment, we'll be down to half of that. So half of 112 is 56. 
So if I see the number 56 written anywhere on the page here, I'm going to give you those three marks, the three partial credit marks. Because if I correctly identified what the half-life means. So it means if we start out with 112 micrograms, how long does it take to get down to 56 micrograms? Half of that. And I think once you realise what you're, what you're doing here, you'll probably say, well, that's easy to do here. Let me find 56 over there. Let me go across like hit the graph. And let me go down like that. And actually draw that, that line on your graph. When the examiner says, use your graph, make sure you, can, you show him that I did. He specified a method here. Don't leave him in any doubt at all that you use the method he specified or you won't get any of the marks. So when you're asked to use your graph, it's very good practice to draw a line on the graph I'd have to show him I used the method you told me to use. Okay? And it looks like it's around about 5.2 years or thereabouts. Okay? Make sure you include your units when you're giving your answer because um, you lose a mark if you don't. Okay, so 5.2 years. I think if you've drawn that graph in any way accurately, you're going to get an answer that's very close to 5.2. There won't be any real variation there. It's not a, it's not a very um, steep curve. So most people get an answer around about 5.2 if they're doing it in any way correctly for five marks. Okay? Part four, then, is when this question kind of shows its teeth a little bit. Because what we're asked to do is we're asked to show this. Show that t is equal to 15 over 2 times the natural log of a0 minus natural log at. Now, the problem a lot of students will have here is I'm not even sure what the question's asking me. It's asking me to show this here. I'm not even sure what that what, what you what, what want me to do. This actually is that equation again. The only difference is that we're not using numbers. We're leaving in the letters. That's what he's asking you to do. Because if you look at this, when we're trying to solve this equation here, see where we've got this letter x up here in the power and we want to get the x by itself on the left-hand side. If you look at the formula I have here, see that letter t up there? See what he wants me to get that t by itself on the left-hand side? So he's asking me to solve this equation, but not using numbers, leaving the letters in there. Okay, but the sequence of steps is the same. So that's the first thing I've got to realise, what he wants me to do here. So if I take the formula as it was given in the question, at equals a0 times e to the power of minus 2t over 15. Remember when we were solving our old friend here on page 8? Our first step was to divide across by that number there. Okay, let's do that here. Divide across by the number. So I get AT over A0 equals E to the power of minus 2T over 15. Same first step, get rid of the number out in front. Right? Second step then is get rid of the, the, this number here. So how do I get rid of that? But remember the key thing here is how do I get rid of E to the power of I use logs? And I, I use natural log. So I'm going to use natural log. That's a good sign because our natural logs are my answer. So I can see where the natural logs are coming from. So if I take the natural log of both sides, on the right-hand side, I get natural log like that. And when I do that, natural log and e to the power will cancel. So I'm just going to put minus 2t over 15. And then over here, I get natural log of at over a0. Now, in the previous questions, because these were numbers, that goes straight to my calculator. I don't have to worry about it anymore. But because these are letters, I can't do that. And now, here's the, the big moment of this question. If I can spot what happens on the left-hand side here, I'm going to get the right answer. Okay? This requires one of your rules of logs. So you might remember on page 21, they're detailed for you on the handout anyway, that you've got six rules for working with logs on, on um, the left-hand side. Or sorry, on, on, the, on the middle of page 21 of your formula booklet. And one of the rules of logs is this one here that the log of a fraction can be written as the log of the top minus the log of the bottom. That's on page 21. Now, what I like about the way this question is, he didn't ask you to find out what t was equal to. He said, show that t is equal to this. He's given you a look at the answer. That's really good practice from an exam, because if you look at that, if I keep my eye on the prize, I've got this line here. And I'm saying, okay, that's the answer I'm trying to get at. See if I've got a fraction here, and I've got one log minus another. That might be enough for me. Oh, yes, there's a rule of logs. So if I keep my eye on the prize, that might say, hang on, yeah, isn't the log of a fraction equal to one log minus another? That's where my next step comes from. So actually, by giving you the answer, he's pushing you in the right direction. He's hoping that, that you'll, you'll put the, the pieces together in your head. So I can write the left-hand side here as the natural log of the top minus the natural log at the bottom. So the log of a fraction can be written as the log at the top minus the log at the bottom. That's one of your rules from page 21, okay? And now it's all over, if I get that far. Because look how similar um, my, my, what I've got now is the final answer. First thing I want to do, get rid of that minus sign. 
So if I multiply across by minus 1, 2, I'd have to change this into a plus natural log a0 and make that one negative. Okay? So I'll get natural log a0, I'll put that first, minus natural log at. Just change the signs of all these, so I'll just swap the order from here. Is equal to 2t over 15. And then if I multiply across by 15 and divide by 2, that's where I get the 15 over 2 on the, uh, over here. So I get 15 over 2 times natural log a0 minus natural log at is equal to t. And there's your a moment. Okay, exactly what you want me to show. So you can see it's actually the very same equation we met already, but just I'm working with letters instead. That's much trickier. Okay, and again, that involves a rule of logs, which you may not have spotted. He set you up. He's point pushed you in the right direction. You might not have spotted that, but getting anywhere down around here will at least get you the three out of five. See why the question's only worth five marks because he knows a lot of people are not going to be able to answer it. So it's not carrying a huge number of marks. So the people who can't do this, which you know, which you know, there'll be quite a few, are not very heavily penalised by not being able to do so. Good question. And um, just two things then to finish up that question very quickly. Um, page fifteen there. It says, hence calculate a more accurate estimate for the half-life of cobalt-60. So notice that we got a pretty good estimate for, for the half-life of cobalt-60 from our graph. It was about 5.2 years. He says, hence calculate a more accurate estimate. And remember, the word hence means using what you just did. There's two ways he can use that, that word. He can use the word hence by itself, or he can use hence or otherwise. Now, if he phrases a question, hence or otherwise, he's giving you a clue. Because the or otherwise bit means, he says, look, you can do the question any way you like, but it's possible to do it with using what you just did. So if you can't think of anything else, you've got no better ideas, have a look at what you just did um, and see if that helps you. So hence or otherwise means you can do the question any way you like, but you can certainly do it using the previous answer if you're struggling, if you can't think of anything else. When you use the word hence on its own, he means you have to use the previous word. You can't, the, or, the lack of the or otherwise means you can't do it either way. You must use the previous um, solution. So but that was the answer to the previous solution. So all I've got to do is drop the two numbers from, the, from this calculation here, the 112 and the 56, in here, into the answer from the previous part of the question. So anyway, I, because he gave me the answer to the previous part of the question, I'd be able to do part 5 even if I wasn't able to do part 4. If he said in part 4, find what t is equal to, if I couldn't do part 4, I wouldn't have a formula to use in part 5 either, so those marks are gone as well. So this is good exam practice. He gives you what the formula here is, so I can do part 5, even if I wasn't able to show where that formula comes from in part 4. So if I put the numbers in there, I get that t is equal to 15 over 2, times the natural log of a0 is 112, minus the natural log of at is 56. If you pop out your calculator, you get about 5.1986, and it doesn't get much better than that, does it? 5.2 from your graph, and 5.1986 years there. Ridiculously similar. Now I'm delighted. Now feel free to slide across the exam floor hall on your knees, jump her over your head. You know you've done it correctly. Okay, you get that little bit of reinforcement. Okay, great question. Last part we look at, I'm not going to do part 7 with you, because part 7 is just a very simple calculation. We've done a few of those already. But look at part 6. How long would it take for the cobalt 60 kind of a sample to drop to zero? So you can see the amount of cobalt-60 is going down, 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 down over time. How long would it take to reach zero? Now, if you don't spot what this question is getting at, what you may do is you may go ahead and solve the equation. Okay, just like we've done before, or at least try to. So you'll say, right, I want to know how long would it take for this to reach zero. So I put the, the zero over there. Zero is equal to 1, 1, 2 times e to the power of minus 2 t over 15. Okay? Same sequence of steps using the equation we had on page 8. I begin by dividing by 112. So 0 divided by 112 is still 0. So I get that. So it's all going swimmingly so far. Now I'm going to get rid of that e. How do I get rid of the e? Natural log of both sides. I've done that a few times now. So on the right hand side I take the natural log like that. Okay, and the natural log of e to the power of cancel. And leave this on the right hand side that way. So I've got to take, the, whatever I do on the right, I've got to do on the left. So natural log of zero, and I pop that into my calculator, and then your world falls apart. Okay? But you get a math error. So now you're kind of saying, God, I'm obviously doing this completely wrong. You're not. There's no problem with this. What you haven't explained is, why is there a math error? Why do I get zero here? Okay? The problem is, if you realize, if you remember what, this, what these exponential decay graphs look like, 
that what happens here is, as you get an exponential decay graph, the graph goes down, down like that, and the graph will get closer and closer and close to the x-axis, but never touch it. Okay? The word you may have come across last year for that is the x-axis is an asymptote. It's a line that the curve gets closer and closer to as, as, you, as you push towards infinity. All right? So the, the graph is an asymptote. The way I would normally explain that to my students when you're doing an exponential decay like this is suppose I give you a lot of stuff this morning and I tell you that every day from now on I'm going to take back half of what you're holding. So on day one I take half of the stuff back and leave you with half. The next day I take half of that back and leave you with a quarter. The next day I take half of that back and leave you with one eighth. And you go down to one sixteenth and one over thirty two and so on. So the amount of stuff you're left holding is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and stupidly small. But it'll never reach zero because it's never going to be a day when I'm going to take everything away from you, money ever removing half. So that's what's going on here with the next wedge decay. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's reducing by a fraction each time, therefore it'll never reach zero. Okay, that's what the quest is getting at. So you will get students who will kind of just write down never reach zero, and that's not really mathematically accurate. So once you realise that's what the question is getting at, the answer, the theoretical answer, is infinity. It can take an infinite amount of time. That might sound like a kind of an abstract answer, but that's the correct answer. How, because he said, how long will it take? Your answer must be a time value, and the time it'll take is it'll take an infinite amount of time to get there. So that's, that's uh, the way we answer that question. So once you recognise exactly that when he asks you about an exponential decay reaching zero, this is what he's driving at. Do you understand that the graph doesn't hit the x-axis? It, it approaches it, but doesn't touch it. You're asked to justify it. Explain why that's the case. Um, if you understand limits, that's the best way to explain this. Okay, so a lot of people would pull, and um, a lot of teachers would pull this out of fresh air and say, well, the obvious explanation there is that the limit as t approaches infinity, okay, of a t equals zero. So in other words, as this gets closer and closer to that, this gets closer and closer to that. That's what a limit statement means. So as this gets closer and closer to that, this gets closer and closer to that. So as the time gets closer and closer to infinity, it gets ridiculously large, the amount of cobalt that you left will get closer and closer to zero. That's a limit statement. That is the, the, the gold standard answer. Okay, that's the perfect answer to that question there. Okay, that's how we, we justify it. If you're not good with limits, and you're in very good company if that's the case, a lot of people have struggled with the idea of a limit, okay? And you're not convinced you'd be able to write that down convincingly, because remember, if you get that wrong, if you, if you, if you jumble these symbols up a little bit, you get mathematical gibberish, all right? So if you're not going to be able to phrase that, back it up by doing that little sketch there, okay? And say something like, it never reaches zero, okay? Or, or mental it's an asymptote, or something like that. Get the idea across. Show the examiner I get what the question's asking me. Because if you don't get full marks for that, you'll be unlucky. He may very well be, that's definitely, that's a guaranteed full mark answer. But rather than not leaving it blank and not giving an explanation at all, at least show him you understand what the question's asking you, if you don't know how to phrase it mathematically. And you'll be very unlucky not to get full marks for that because you've shown me, look, you've given me the right answer, you've shown me that you understand what the question's asking for, I'm happy. All right, so that's much better than trying to waffle out something you're not good with limits but that's the answer I would aim for. Okay? And as I said, I'm not going to do the one on page, the one on the bottom of that page because um, it's just a very simple calculation like we've done before. So what wouldn't be the worst idea in the world then is um, yourself, you pause the video there and maybe have a quick look at the one on the next three pages. Just before you do that, um, you will notice on the bottom of page 17 and the top of page 18, <coughs> you've got two parts of that question that are marked as being difficult. They've got the bitch symbol there. Those two questions are a bitch. They're really, really tough. Particularly on page 18, that you can see where it says, find the minimum combined value. That word should trigger you. Minimum differential calculus. That's a differential calculus question. We're going to talk a bit more about that in a second. But very often, the examiner in a long question this topic will throw in a bit of calculus toward the end to try and catch you out. So that last part there is very, very tough. It's differential calculus. If you haven't done calculus yet, you're not going to be able to make any attempt at that at all. But you can have a try at that question there. It's a very difficult one, though. I think you'll find that one quite, quite tough. And we'll pick it up with the next question there in a second on page 19.